Okay, we are live. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On today's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Hugh Turley. Last name is spelled T-U-R-L-E-Y. And he's been on my show before. We've talked about a number of subjects. One was the martyrdom of Thomas Merton. That was one of our early shows. And the full title of the book is The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an Investigation. I believe it was published in 2018. He wrote that with David Martin, who I've also had on the show. We've talked about the murder of James Forrestal and also the murder of Vince Foster. But I've also had Hugh on. He was with attorney John Clark. We talked about the death of Vince Foster. And Clark was the uh, attorney for a guy by the name of Patrick Knowlton, who unfortunately has passed away. But he was kind of an on-site witness to what happened at Fort Marcy Park. That contradicted the public statement, surprise, surprise, of the FBI. And then he was harassed for it, fall around with weird guys with black briefcases. Stories that back in the day were unbelievable, but now in 2024, like people can put it together like, whoa. But this was back in, I think Vince Foster was murdered. Sorry, he committed suicide in a park is what the cover story is. But he died in 1993, so it's been 30 years. But um, today, I got uh, uh, Hugh reached out to me. Uh, recently and said he had just published a new book so i was like hey oh, great come on and let's talk about it and it's about this thomas merton situation right and which is a cover story and we went we talked about this uh thomas merton merton's death and um an investigation and what the cover how sketchy the cover story was and you, you have to put it in context to the 60s were really rife with assassinations and i think they make the case that his was one of these the same year as MLK and RFK. But the new book by Hugh Turley, the full title, is Thomas Merton's Betrayers, the case against Abbott James Fox and author John Howard Griffin. And he wrote this as well with David Martin, who unfortunately couldn't join us, but he's here in spirit. So Hugh Turley, welcome back to the show. Thank you for inviting me back on. It's always a pleasure. And uh, I, I thought I'd begin today by just telling uh your audience who Thomas Merton was because he, he lived a long time ago. Yeah, he was, uh, he was born in 1915 and he uh, was the, the convert to the Catholic faith in 1938. He entered a monastery for Trappist monks in 1941 and uh, the abbot there was an abbot Dunn who encouraged him to write. He was a very talented writer and at a young age he wrote an autobiography of his life, which came up to be a surprising best-selling book. It sold, I think, 600,000 copies out of the gate. And uh, at that time, the abbot uh, that encouraged him to write, Abbot Dunn, died, and a new abbot came in, Abbot James Fox. And he had a 19-year struggle with Merton, the two of them, and they say that Fox was Merton's nemesis. So Merton, uh, initially, uh, when, the, when the book took off, uh, Fox, was very interested in the Abbey making money. Uh, and he had the monks making bread and fudge and bacon and uh, fruit cakes. They still make fruit cakes. They still make fudge. It's famous fudge worldwide. The yes, Ab they do. Uh, <laughs> Abbey of Gethsemane, yes. That's right. And they, they were in the, the business, see. But Merton's uh, first royalty check would be worth about $10,000 in today's money. And when the abbot saw the check, he told Merton, I want you to keep writing. And he did, but most of his books at that time were spiritual books and books about uh, the Catholic faith and, and, and contemplation. One of my favorites at that time was uh, published in the 50s called The Living Bread. Uh, it was about the Holy Eucharist. And in those days, in the 50s and early 60s, Merton's books were in probably every Catholic home in the United States. Uh, there was a popular bishop, uh, Fulton Sheen, who was on television but uh, Merton was the writer, and he probably wrote all together in about 70 books, and there's probably another 70 that were written about him. He's, I would say, the most famous and influential Catholic writer of the 20th century. But something happened uh, in his life around 1960. He'd gone into the monastery to, to leave the world, but he, he had an awakening to the outside world, and he took an interest in, in his fellow human beings, and in the world outside the monastery. And he started to write about peace. And he wrote that Catholics had an obligation to oppose violence. And this brought him into conflict with the warfare 
uh, the state of the United States because we were, uh, after World War II, we've been sort of uh, bombing people forever. We haven't stopped. Yeah, it's almost like the war never stops. Right, and he he was very similar to two other men that died the same year as he did, and that would be uh, Martin Luther King, when he died in March, and then uh, Robert F. Kennedy died in June, and they were openly assassinated. But Merton's death was what they uh, term in the CIA as a secret assassination because it wasn't an open assassination. His death was called an accident, and everybody thought it was an accident, but he died the same year. It was in December, on December 10th, 1968. But those three men had a lot of things in common. In fact, Merton died exactly 20 years after Mahatma Gandhi, who was another man who was a, an advocate for peace. So this is uh, who Thomas Merton was. I uh, kind of fell into him quite by accident. And uh, since I read his biography and then my friend David Martin, who, who co-authored our first book with me, told me I should look into Merton's death. So I, I did that and I, I kind of followed the, what I learned when I worked with uh, John Clark and Patrick Nolt, and I, I went uh, back to the beginning. I wanted to get the official documents, the death certificate, the doctor's certificate, the police report, an autopsy report if there was one. I thought there should be one, but there, it turned out there wasn't one. And I wanted to get the initial uh, first records of, of anything that was available. And I found uh, that the official documents do not say that he died by accident, even though that story has been repeated and repeated for 50 years or more now, uh, but that's not the official cause of death. The official cause of death was natural cause and that it was a sudden heart failure. Can you explain what the original story was? It had to do with like an electric fan, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it was a, they said he was electrocuted by a fan stepping out of a shower. But there's, if you, if you look at the official documents, uh, I found them at the National Archives because I, I figured they'd be there because he died overseas and the embassy would file a report. And I did find the documents at the archives. I also got them from another uh, man who was at the conference at the time who brought copies back with the official stamp of the embassy on them. And he brought them back and kept them for 50 years. And when I asked him if he knew anything about the death, he sent me the documents. So I got them from two different sources. I sent them to the Merton Center at Bellarmine University and they said they'd never seen them before. And I'd also learned in my research that the Abbey of Gethsemane where Martin lived had been sent the same documents. So I contacted them to see if their copies were the same or different. And they told me they didn't have them because they said they lost them conveniently. Right. So, and he died for people who don't know. He also died not in the U S he was in Bangkok, Thailand. A retreat in Thailand too. Yeah, near, near Bangkok. He was about 19 miles South of Bangkok. So he died overseas. Now, the, the most significant things that we found for our first book uh, were these official documents that contradicted the cause of death. They also had some other anomalies, like they said that an autopsy had been conducted and there hadn't been. But uh, that was there's, there were a lot of contradictions. Our whole first book was all about what happened in Thailand. We went through the everything, uh, the witness reports and things that we could find, uh, the police report, the official documents. But a key thing that we found in, the, in our first investigation was some photographs because the body was discovered by three Benedictine monks. And when they found the body, uh, they, it didn't look right. It looked suspicious. And they, they thought this is something's wrong here. They just had a gut feeling. So one of them got his camera and took some photographs. He took two pictures. And uh, at the time, only one of them turned out. The other one was uh, underexposed. And these, I, I knew the photographs were taken, and I, I learned through re reading uh, letters that were sent at the time that the, that the negatives had been sent to the Abbey of Gethsemane. They requested them when they found out about them and said they needed to protect them. And the monk who took the pictures was a Filipino, and he sent the pictures to the Abbey so they could be protected. Well, that would protect it, and that ended up being disappeared. <laughs> and they were, they were gone for 50 years. And uh, I found them up at uh, Columbia University in the papers of John Howard Griffin, who's in the subtitle of our second book. But I, I, when I found the negatives, uh, Columbia didn't know what they had, but they printed them for me and gave me really nice uh, high-resolution copies. I had drawings made. I asked the Abbey to get somebody if I could publish them in our, our first book, and they said absolutely not because, see, they were given to the Abbey as a gift, so they own the copyright. So I, I couldn't even publish a drawing 
of these things. And then the book came out. We described them in detail. And we went through the whole, I'm not going to go through the whole first book again, but the, the first book, I'll, I'll hold it up. It's, uh, this is the, the martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. And when our book came out, we really thought <laughs> that people at the monastery and, and the friends of Merton would be interested in what we'd written because this is pretty shocking uh, evidence that he'd been murdered. But uh, the reaction was, was not at all what we expected. Uh, they were pretty cold and uh, actually hostile toward us. And uh, we didn't get any good reviews from them at all. Now, I did find some other people who were very supportive. Of, like the folk singer, Judy Collins, I don't know if you know this one, but she wrote a song after reading her first book called Thomas Merton. It was released on her album about a year ago. Oh, wow. Spellbound. It was her, her, her first uh, album of, of all songs that she composed. And she wrote a song about his death uh, based on our first book. It doesn't follow exactly the facts, but it's it's making the point that he was assassinated. Uh, we've had other people that supported our work, but but the Abbey of Gethsemane was surprisingly cool. And I drove down there with my wife in 2019. I wanted to talk to the monks, and they told me to leave, that I was not welcome there. Which is Why do you think they were resistant to what you had to say? Why the, why the cold shoulder? Well, that's... That was our thought, was what, what is going on here? So that's, that's what prompted the second book, because, uh, because our first book was all about Thailand uh, and what happened there. We, uh, we, once we realized that the Abbey was not happy with us, uh, you know, and you have to wonder, why are they covering up the truth? And what, what's, what's the problem here? So that brought about our investigation into what happened in Kentucky. And since Merton was murdered in Thailand, he didn't just get there by accident. He, he lived in this monastery under Abbot Fox for 19 years. In fact, he was never permitted to travel. I think he took two trips in all that time. He went one day trip to New York and another trip uh, with the abbot who accompanied him to Minnesota for a few days. But he was really restricted to only doctor's appointments. So how did he get to Thailand? Well, you know, we had to look at a timeline and see how things played out. What, how did he get there? And, and then what did the Abbey do after his death? And where did this story about the accidental electrocution originate? It didn't come from Thailand. It's not in the Thai documents. So it came from somewhere. So we were curious to uh, nail down the origin of the false accidental electrocution story and also uh, see how it was promoted and who promoted it. And that's what the second book is all about. It's about the, the cover-up of the murder and the setup for the murder and, and even the motives for the murder. Because the people that killed Thomas Merton certainly weren't the monks at Gethsemane, but they did help cover it up. And the people that did kill Thomas Merton had to be able to count on the Abbey to keep quiet, you know, and not, not to have an autopsy done or, 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 uh, or make any, any noise about it. And to go they along with the cover story, right? They went with the cover story. And you, you have to, that, 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 that brings us to, to examine what was going on back there. And so the, the subtitle of our second book is The Case Against Abbot James Fox and author John Howard Griffin. And interestingly, James Fox was not even mentioned in our first book, but he's a key player in the second book. Because now we're writing about what goes on in Kentucky as opposed to what went on in Thailand. So the second book sort of, you know, it, it revisits things in Thailand, uh, particularly the origin of the story. The first person to put out the story that Merton had been accidentally electrocuted was an Associated Press reporter, John Wheeler. And he reported this the following day, and his source was an anonymous Catholic source in Thailand. So he didn't even have a source. And he had facts wrong in his story. For example, he said that Merton had missed lunch and when he didn't show up for lunch, people weren't looking for him. Well, that's not true because he was at lunch. Uh, one of his uh, cabin mates, there were four men in the cottage with him. One of them gave him the key to the cottage and he and another monk that lived in the cottage with Merton, they were at this retreat. They walked back to the cottage together from lunch. So he definitely did not miss lunch. But the AP Associated Press story had a lot of bad information in it, including that he missed lunch. So that's that's really where the story started. Now, the Abbey kind of came out of the, 
you know, they came out of the gate a little funny because they put out a story to the New York Times the following day that Merton had been uh, suffered a, uh, a sudden heart failure. But that story was then pulled back. Uh, it went out in the early edition, and then the later edition said that the Abbey did not know how he died. And a number of papers were publishing the story that the Abbey did not know how he died. Uh, the abbot at the monastery was telling the monks that Merton had had an accident, but he didn't know any more about it. Uh, and, and then, you know, it sort of limped out. But eventually the abbey, within a few days, was saying that it was an accidental electrocution with a fan with no other details. And that's sort of how that they, they, they started to go out with it. So the abbey picked up the AP line. The initial story that they put out about the natural cause was that was never even told to the monks. The monks at the Abbey uh, were pretty much deceived like the rest of the world. They were not told, you know, there's 200 monks living there. They don't all know what's going on, but there were a handful of them. There was Abbot Flavian, uh, Abbot Fox, of course, and then uh, uh, Patrick Hart, brother Patrick Hart, who had been Fox's secretary for about 10 years. Let me say this, Joe, and you go back in the timeline here. See, before, before Merton went to uh, Thailand, he was, he was bringing a lot of income to the Abbey for his, his books. And Abbot Fox was very pleased with this. But he also was kept at night. He was awake and worried that Merton might leave the Abbey because there goes the royalties. And you know, Golden Merton, goose. He was really the golden goose. He was. And he could just walk out the gate, see. But he was, Merton was, was not actually interested in leaving the Abbey, but he was trying to transfer to another religious community, because living under Abbot Fox was really difficult. Fox uh, treated him very shabbily, and they were like opposites. I mean, Merton was not interested in money. Fox was all about the money, and they clashed. And uh, Fox thought, well, if he goes to another religious community, he could take all his royalties with him, and then the other religious community would have the royalties. Or if he just left altogether and became a private citizen, the Abbey risked losing those royalties. So they, you know, when the plan came to have Merton assassinated in Thailand, this was an opportunity for the Abbey to lock in the royalties. So a year, uh, let's see, it'd be uh, just about a year before Merton's death, in November of 1967, uh, Abbot Fox had Merton sign a document that in the event of his death, his entire literary estate, and it's not just books and journals and things. He drew pictures. He drew, he, he was a, a drawer. He was a photographer. And there were, there was poetry. There was a lot of things that were unpublished that could be published. And he signed everything over in the event of his death. Well, once he did that, he was done because they, they, they appointed a, a Merton Legacy Trust that would handle the estate, the literary estate in the event of his death. Well, what do you know? If, uh, right after this happens, Fox decides he's going to retire and he steps down but not exactly steps down. He, he didn't leave the Abbey. Now, normally when a, an abbot leaves his position and steps down, he goes somewhere else. He'll go to Rome. He'll go to another Abbey. He'll retire someplace else so he doesn't overshadow the new guy. But Fox did not leave the Abbey of Gethsemane. He stayed there after he stepped down. And we found in correspondence and letters that he was still pulling strings behind the scenes. In fact, Merton had written to one of his friends that the abbot was going to step down, but he said, he's not leaving here. And he said, I think he'll still be pulling strings. And indeed he was. So once he stepped down, it looked like he was out of the picture. Now he, everybody knew that he would never let Merton travel. Well, as soon as he steps down, Merton gets an invitation to go to this retreat in Thailand and the new abbot says, oh, sure, you can go. In fact, he said, even before you go, he was going to let him take some trips around the United States. And he gave him permission to travel to New Mexico, California, and Alaska, and, and visit some of the Western states uh, before he made his journey to Asia, where he went to India and, and uh, the Himalayas and, and Tibet, and then uh, on to Thailand. He was supposed to go to Japan next. But see, this whole travel thing came about after he signed away the estate in the event of his death. So see, see how things are all sort of lined up in, a, in, a, in a getting things in order for him to die. Right. 
It's and, like and, the setup, the the pre-setting, right? Right. It just didn't happen by accident that he's over there and then he gets killed. There was for a people. Fire. Sorry to interrupt, but for people who don't know, you have to remember at that time, Southeast Asia was full. Of, the war was going on. Yeah. There were flights, bases, operators, all kinds of subterfuge, not just in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Yeah, that's an important point. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because in Thailand at the time, there was a program called Operation Phoenix. And William Colby was later the CIA director and died mysteriously himself. But he was in charge of Operation Phoenix and it was an assassination program. And they assassinated, they say, some estimates were 40,000 people. Uh, I think the US claims it was only like 21,000 people, but they were assassinating people throughout uh, Vietnam, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and Southeast Asia. And they were based in Thailand. We had huge military bases in Thailand. We, we were bombing North Vietnam from Thailand because if we didn't fly from Thailand, we had to fly from Guam, which was like a thousand miles away. So most of our bombing of North Vietnam came out of Thailand. So we had a huge military presence, a huge CIA assassination presence. <laughs> These people were trained assassins. Right. And, and when, there he is, walks right into the He line. walks right into the nest, yeah. And, they, and he's opposed to the war. You know, He's a vocal opponent of the Vietnam War, uh, telling people that this war is immoral and it's wrong, and that the U.S. news media is nothing but a big propaganda organ that's uh, selling uh, people on, on war. Hmm. Times haven't changed much. <laughs> you know, he was really... Uh, you can just interpose... Ukraine with Vietnam or something like that. Yeah, That's, if you yeah, if you're pro Palestinian and you walk into Gaza right now, it'd be about right. the same thing. You're just you know you're going to be a target. Yeah. So that that, so, that happened, and I see this was all none of this was in our first book because we were just looking at Thailand. But see that was just that's the first part of the book about Fox and who he was, and then then you get to uh, after the death and what happens, and. These photographs are just, they're so crucial because uh, they expose the lies that have been told. Uh, uh, there was a letter that the Abbey put out after Merton's death. They claimed that it was from some monks that were at the conference. But it, we, Martin and I determined that this was a bogus letter. It was a fake letter. It said that this fan was found on Merton's chest, and... Uh, but it had a lot of information wrong. It said there were two Thai doctors at the scene. There were only one. And the, the, the strangest thing about the letter is it's, it's not even signed. It's, at the very end, it says, signed by the six Trappists at the conference. Well, actually, there were seven. But they, they said signed by the six. It's, it's almost like you bring a note to school and say, uh, may my son be excused today, signed by William Ramsey's mother. <laughs> you know? I mean, if it doesn't have your mom's signature, it just says signed by the mother. That doesn't wash. Well, they put this letter out, and of course, those, the photographs show that the fan's not on the chest. Now, uh, Abbott Fox, who is the one that had retired, for some reason, he's not even supposed to be in charge anymore, and he puts out a letter to all of the monks that are abroad from the Abbey to tell them about Merton's death, and he goes into details about how this fan was found lying across his chest, pinning him down, and it had burned deeply into his chest. Well, you know, if this was true, you'd think, well, maybe that caused the heart failure. But if you look at the pictures, you can see that the fan is not on his chest. It's actually, the base of the fan is by his feet. It's, it's kind of going diagonal across, and it rests on his right pelvis, and then the, the, the bigger part of the fan is up uh, where the blades are, over, over his right shoulder, or next to his right shoulder. And the strangest thing is he's lying perfectly straight on his back. Now, it's almost impossible for a person to fall flat on their back with their arms at their side. It's it's just not the way people fall. They bend their knees and they throw their arms out to break the fall. It's instinctive. But uh, here he is lying flat on his back with his arms at his side and this strange fan lying across him. Well, naturally, these, these monks see this. And, and one of them even wrote a statement later saying that he thought it was very odd the position of the arms straight at his side. He said I, he didn't think he could have possibly been touching that fan and his arms ended up in that position. And that's frankly why they took the pictures. Because what the pictures show us is what is known as a staged crime scene. Okay? And I, when I worked with John and Patrick uh, on the Foster case, 
we had a textbook on homicide by Vernon Gebert. It is the leading book on homicide investigations used by all police academies, the FBI Academy at Quantico. And he came out with a new edition in 2015 with a special section that's just about the staged crime scene, see? And this scene is the stage scene. It has all the characteristics. And it's not just the, uh, the pictures, which if you look at them, you can see it's staged. It's also a thing that uh, Vernon Gebreth calls ambiguity. He said in a stage scene, you've got more than one cause of death. Now there's really just four ways people die. There's homicide, suicide, uh, natural cause, and accident. And all of us die in one of those four ways. But if you're dying in two ways, that's a symptom of a, a characteristic of a, of a stage scene. So Merton's death did have two causes of death. It was the accidental electrocution on the one hand, and then it was also sudden heart failure. And then people say, well, the electrocution caused the heart failure or the, the heart failure caused him to fall into the fan. Or, you know, and they try to say that both happened. Uh, my co-author, David Martin, says, sir, like stepping on a rattlesnake at the same time you get hit by lightning. Right. <laughs> Two yeah. things at once. Well, this is this is another characteristic of the, of the stage scene. So this is why, right out of the gate, John Howard Griffin saw the photograph, and he told Abbot Flavian and Brother Patrick, these can never be shown to anyone. These must be deeply hidden forever. And they were for 50 years. But see, I guess Mar uh, John Howard Griffin just couldn't help himself, so he kept those negatives. For yeah. people who don't know, can you explain who author John Howard Griffin was? Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's another story. But I'll tell you something funny, too, that you can see. John Howard Griffin was very popular when I was in um, grade school, like seventh, eighth grade, beginning high school, in the early 60s. He wrote a book called Black Like Me. And in the story, he said that he turned his skin black using uh, chemicals and dyes and, and a sun lamp. It took him several days, and then he, he made himself look like a black man. And then he went out and roamed around the southern uh, states, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and, and wrote about how, how badly he was treated by the whites down there. And then he was on, he was interviewed by Mike Wallace, you know, 60 Minutes. He was on the NBC Today show with Dave Garraway. The mainstream media just publicized the heck out of the guy, and his book was assigned to all the kids in school. We all read it. It was just like a... Everybody knew who John Howard Griffin was. He was the guy that became a black man. They even made a movie about it starring James Whitmore. And uh, that's on YouTube. It's pretty funny to look at because it's so dated. And James Whitmore doesn't look like a black man. He looks like James Whitmore in blackface because that's what he is. <laughs> now, if you want to see something that's really a hoot, uh, go on YouTube and find Eddie Murphy. He did a thing on Saturday Night Live called White Like Me. <laughs> which Eddie Murphy made himself white. And then he, he went around and everybody treated him really nice. <laughs> Eddie Murphy's a very clever comedian. That is a very, very funny. Yeah, they gave him free money, bank loans, all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very funny. It's a funny, funny bit. And I, that came out of the 25th anniversary of the Black Like Me, was Eddie Murphy's skin. I thought Eddie Murphy did a, a very clever job with that. So anyway, that's who John Howard Griffin was known to the public. But we did a bigger dive on him in our book because he's, you know, there had to be some connection between the the government and the Abbey. I mean, who, the monks didn't kill Thomas Merton. They just helped cover it up. So who's the government connection to the Abbey? Well, it's John Howard Griffin. And and if you, if you dig into his past, you see that he has the military intelligence background and he has a very strange background. I think the whole Black Like Me story doesn't even make any sense if you, if you really take a careful read of his book because he talks about going into the bushes and using some cold cream and uh, and tissues and making himself white and coming out white and then going back in the bushes again and making himself black in a matter of minutes. It's like Superman stepping into a phone booth. Well, this is just not, this is not believable. I mean, you're going to miss the spot behind your ear. Uh, just, it's ridiculous that you could make yourself passable as a black person with some dye in the bushes in a matter of minutes. I mean, anyway, that's in the beginning of the book, he has to be under a sun lamp with chemicals for several days. But later in the book, he said he learned how to transition more quickly. Well, if you want to believe that, 
But uh, he uh, also did some spying in Mexico with the embassy down there when there were some riots. He's, that's revealed in our book. He uh, was in the military during World War II doing intelligence work, and he moved around uh, the Pacific Theater, and he claimed that he had uh, been wounded, and this led to a period of blindness, because he wrote. He also wrote about, before he was black like me, he was blind like me, and he wrote a book about becoming blind after the war. Well, if you, if you read uh, Thomas Merton's Betrayers, you see that Griffin's story about becoming blind is about as believable as, as becoming black. Uh, and his story of a war injury doesn't make much sense because I pulled his war record and uh, he has no Purple Heart, he has no injuries. But his story was that the Japanese bomb caused him this concussion. He was in the hospital and on and on, but the, his military record doesn't support it. He's a very shady character, and he's connected to this guy, Penn Jones, who wrote uh, uh, about the Kennedy assassination and was sort of an early critic of the Warren Commission report. Uh, and but Penn Jones is a suspicious character, too, like, like Griffin. And he went to the Philippines to interview the Filipino that took the photographs to see if he was suspicious. And he told this Filipino that he thought Merton had been assassinated like King and Kennedy. Well, who's paying this guy's way to the Philippines? He was they had a small town paper in uh, Texas. He lived a, f a few miles from John Howard Griffin. They were old buddies, and uh, he also had a military background. So Penn Jones is a uh, you know we we bring him up kind of out in the, in our second book, so you learn who Penn Jones was and John Howard Griffin. So these this is sort of the government connection to uh, to the assassins and to uh, and to the monastery. And Griffin came to the monastery, supposedly for a retreat, met uh, Merton. Even Penn Jones came to the monastery with Griffin on one trip to meet Merton. And they had uh, they had uh, taken a photography. Merton was a, became a photographer because of Griffin. Griffin was a, a photographer. That's why I think he knew when he saw those crime scene photographs of the stage scene, he knew exactly what he was looking at. And that's why he said they should never be shown. So then... Uh, right after Merton's death, uh, Griffin was appointed by the Merton Legacy Trust to become uh, the author of the, the Merton biography, which he never wrote, uh, but he spent several years. But what he, what he did instead of writing the biography is he contacted all of the witnesses that were in Thailand. He contacted the Filipino and the others, uh, and he, he corresponded with people who wanted to know what they saw uh, if they had any suspicions, if wow, they thought, wow. you know, so he was, he orchestrated the cover up. Now, one of the men that was in the cottage was a guy named John Moffat, who was the poetry editor for America magazine. It's a Jesuit magazine. And he didn't think that Merton died by accident. And he and Griffin exchanged letters back and forth. And in the letters back and forth, uh, Moffat makes his arguments that it's not an accident. And Griffin comes back and says, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Griffin tells him about all these documents that he has. He says, I have all these papers. Well, he, you know, Moffat wants to see the papers. Well, Griffin won't show them to him. He says, well, I'll send them to you. I got to take pictures of them. Well, of course, we had Xerox machines in those days. We didn't take pictures of documents. We just made a Xerox machine copy. But anyway, they went back and forth. And uh, Griffin... Uh, had gathered all of the evidence. He had the photographs, he got the negatives, he got the, the official death documents, but he wasn't sharing things. And, and there was one person in particular he wasn't sharing things with, and that was Tommy O'Callaghan, who was a close friend of Thomas Merton's. And she was on the Merton Legacy Trust with two other characters, James Laughlin and Naomi uh, Burton Stone. And these are New York publishing people. Uh, Mrs. O'Callaghan lived in Louisville. She was a mother of uh, I think seven or eight children, and she was uh, really a good friend of Thomas Merton's. She was on that Merton Legacy Trust, but they weren't sharing any information with her. She was suspicious, but they would send these letters back and forth and say, don't tell her anything. Don't let her even know about the negatives. Don't let her know about this. And they kept things from her. So she kind of, well, the book is called Thomas Merton's Betrayers, but they're also Tommy O'Callaghan's Betrayers because that woman was kept out of the loop. But if you read these letters, I, I collected them at several libraries. Burton Stone's uh, letters are up at uh, the uh, 
Franciscan Monastery of St. Bonaventure. Most of Griffin's papers are at, uh, are related, the ones related to Merton are at the Columbia University. He also has papers in Texas, but those are not related to Merton. And then Moffitt's papers are at the University of Virginia. So you get all of these letters, and what I did is I put them in chronological order so you can read them with the back and forth. But there's a lot of gaps because all the letters are not there because many of them start out by saying, I received your wonderful confidential letter yesterday and burned it. And they talk about burning each other's letters continually. They burn things. They destroy letters. That's not suspicious. That's yeah, not it's suspicious it's, at all. It's always, it's, they're always <laughs> doing this, you know? And they're always saying, don't tell this to Tommy O'Callaghan. And, wow. uh, you know, and, and just look here. Here's one. This is from uh, Naomi Burton. She writes, Dear John, she's writing to John Howard Griffin, thanks for your good letter, which I have destroyed. <laughs> you know? So this is how it went. And see, Brother uh, Patrick and, and uh, Flavian, those two, plus Abbot James Fox, and then you add in James Laughlin and uh, Naomi Burton Stone with John Howard Griffin and Penn Jones. These people were all in on this together. Okay, There was a little group. Now, every monk at the monastery is not involved. They don't know. But some people know. Okay, And, and these people that did know corresponded. Now, they, they did burn a lot of letters, but they didn't burn them all. And uh, being the document digger that I am, I went out and found uh, found a lot of them, and I put them in order and pieced them together, and it, it reveals a cover-up. Now, we just had a big event happen, uh, let's see, April 5th, just a few days ago. There's a, uh, you know, I, I told you I couldn't publish these photographs, which are really, really important. And I, I wanted to just put drawings in the book. I, I, I had a professional Supreme Court artist draw nice drawings of the photographs that would represent what's there. But I thought, you know, the Abbey probably wouldn't give me permission to publish a photograph of the corpse, but that maybe a drawing, they would do it. But they said, absolutely not. And when we published our second book, I asked them again. I said, you know, you really ought to give us permission because the truth is going to eventually come out. And I think you'd look better if you, if you helped bring some of this forward. And the abbot wrote back and said, no, I'm not giving you permission. Don't ever ask me this again. So I can't publish them. If I put them in a book, I could be sued for copyright infringement. But, you know, I think about things, you know, over a period of time, God has a way of, uh, he has his own schedule. It's not mine, but he has his own. And certain, after a period of time, it seems like the time is right to do something different. And I, I remember that the, the news media has a different uh, rule. It's called uh, the uh, Fairness Doctrine. And, and the, uh, the doctrine is uh, that they don't, or the, for, for the public has a right to know, okay? So the public has a right to, to know things, and the media can publish them without permission. So you've probably seen the picture of Robert F. Kennedy lying on his back <clears throat> when he's dying at that uh, kitchen at that hotel. In, in Ambassador Florida. Hotel, yeah. Ambassador Hotel. And, you know, that's a, that's a sad picture. We've seen pictures of John Kennedy being killed. But, you know, you, you, the pictures of Merton, they, they weren't going to let us see them. But I thought, well, you know, a, a journalism group, a newspaper, a magazine, Catholic press, you know, they could do something. Because they, they, there is this uh, doctrine that allows them uh, fair use to publish copyrighted material. So I got in touch with a, a guy who's published some articles for us before, uh, Patrick Jameson. He, he has a newspaper in... Victoria, British Columbia, called the Island Catholic News, and he published a, he's published quarterly. And this quarter, on April fifth, he published an article by Dave Martin and I about the Merton crime scene photographs. And the uh, he he took one of the drawings and he published it in his paper. So if people want to see it, you can go to Island Catholic News, all one word, islandcatholicnews.com. And it will, if you scroll down, you'll see an article about Thomas Merton crime scene photos. And right at the, the lead there, you're going down there now. There it is right there. You click that, and there's the picture. And you can see that the, the fan is not on 
Right, it's away from the body or whatever. I don't know. It's not on his chest. His chest is not burned. I mean, that's that's just that's. You know, what... I think that the, the the electrical system is designed to not immediately kill you anyway. Right. Well, it, it, it would give you a shock. It would give you a shock if you touched the fan. It gave the guy that yeah, you would like pull off or like. Yeah, one of the monks it. touched it and asked him if he was. He said he felt a slight shock. But see, this picture was not shown for several reasons. One, it's a stage scene. They don't want you to see that. Number two, it, it shows that the monastery is put out misinformation when they put out, and they did this several times in in several books, uh, the uh, Asian Journal of Thomas Merton, and also in a book uh, by uh, the Cistercian monks put out a book, and it was published by several other publishers about Thomas Merton the monk, and and they had uh, reprinted uh, Abbot Fox's story about the man, the fan lying across Merton's chest, pinning him down and burning his chest deeply. Well, it's not true. So the Abbey was putting out false information and they don't want anybody to see that. That's why they don't want, that's why they hide this picture. And the other, the other picture, we got it developed. It didn't come out originally, but the Columbia, because of high technology in the digital age, was able to take an underexposed picture and bring it up. So now there's really, there's two pictures Another one's from the side view, but uh, they they both show that the fan is not on Merton's chest, and it's it's uh, this is why they've been hidden. They they hid them because they've been hiding the truth, and and they also hid the documents. They hid the death certificate, the doctor's certificate, and the embassy report, and they hid these documents deliberately because none of them say the death was caused by accidental electrocution, and none of them say he was in a shower. And you'll notice in this picture he's wearing shorts. Those are pajama shorts. And you don't wear your pajama shorts in the shower. And he's not even near a shower. He's in his room. The shower, you have to leave his room and go out into a... Uh, 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 it was all it was total fiction. Just it's like the you go into it's another it's area to get to the shower. All the assassinations were just complete lie. They lied about everything. So they lied about everything. But you mean, thanks for like everything else that's happened. The Benedictine monks that took these photographs... I mean, they're really the heroes. And our first book was dedicated to the, the Benedictine monks. Now, there was an, a nun that came to the scene, Sister Eldertrude Weiss, and she wrote a narrative, a hand, handwritten narrative, and she drew a, a diagram, a handwritten sketch. And she also copies this same picture. She has the fan down near his hip and not on his chest. So there, there's no doubt. And, there, and it's, it's pretty clear why they've been hidden. Now, the Abbey really needs to get on board with the truth because Thomas Merton, uh, he was writing books before he died about uh, war and peace. He had a book called Faith and Violence. He wrote a book called Peace in the Post-Christian Era. And he was an advocate for peace and he was a martyr because he was killed because he was a vocal peace. He was a guy, you know, you can say things and I can say things, it doesn't matter. But when you can draw 250,000 people down on the mall like Martin Luther King, or you're a famous writer like Thomas Merton, who is very well known, and you are advocating for peace, that'll put a target on your back. And that's why he was killed. And I think some people him. speculated that the real, I mean, MLK was a troublemaker for civil rights, but they say once he went on the anti-Vietnam thing, that sealed his fate. That was it, exactly. See, when, when they remember Dr. Martin Luther King today, they talk about him being a civil rights leader. But he, he said himself in his own speech, I think at Riverside Baptist Church in New York, if you think I'm a civil rights leader, you don't know me. And he was an advocate for peace and that and, and against war. And that's what made him a really important man and a man that they wanted to kill. Yeah. There's so much money flow involved in Vietnam, but right to the Johnson family, actually. But uh, here we are at the 45-minute mark. Do you have time for a few questions? Oh, sure. I, I got plenty of time for questions. I could, I could go on Great. and on. Great. Richard asks, do you have any idea... If this is fake, how do you think it really happened? Any idea how he's murdered? Oh, well, that's a good question because pe people uh, often want me to solve the whole crime. But see, uh, what we've what we've proven here is that there's a murder, okay? Because uh, this is an unattended death, and it's a violent death. And uh, he didn't die the way that they told us he died. He he didn't die by accidental electrocution, stepping out of a shower. Okay, he was not in a bathtub either. They've often said that. But the Abbey said he was in the shower. Now, we know we've been lied to about his death. This is very suspicious. Now, how did he die? We don't really know. We know this. The, the, the witnesses, and I should have mentioned this earlier, there was a bleeding wound that bled considerably on the back of his head. And that may have been the fatal wound that killed him. 
but he never had an autopsy. So I don't know the cause of death. We don't know the cause of death. But, you know, you can find a dead body somewhere that looks like a homicide, and you don't know, until you do an autopsy or an investigation, you really don't know how the person died. But you can have a homicide without knowing how they died. And I don't really know how Thomas Merton died, but I know he didn't die the way they told us by accident, stepping out of the shower or touching a fan. That's just not... And, and then you wouldn't go to all the extreme of covering all this stuff up and sending Penn Jones to the Philippines and making up all these stories uh, that aren't true. That's, that's just, it's a cover-up. Right, it's a cover-up, but it's also planned. So they have all these things in place. Everything established was established. Right. Right. It's a murder. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I can't solve the crime. I don't have the ability to do that. But see, I'd like people to advocate for the Roman Catholic Church to open up a process for canonization of Thomas Merton because the monks are not going to let anybody dig up the body at Gethsemane. They won't. Right. Gethsemane is in Bardstown, Kentucky. For people right. Don't. Now, but see, the Catholic Church, if they start a cause for sainthood, they want they don't want anybody venerating a grave unless they know that that person is actually in the grave. The Catholic Church would want to do an investigation of his death. They would want to dig up the body. So we need a cause for canonization. We need to push for his canonization to become a Catholic saint. And that, whether he becomes a saint or not, is going to launch an investigation at least. And we need to have somebody to look at the back of his head and determine if there's any kind of wound in his skull in the back of his head. I mean, that should have been done when he died, but it wasn't. There were fake documents put up. They said that they'd done an autopsy on documents because it was according to the law in Thailand. They were supposed to do an autopsy. And the death certificate... And the, uh, the doctor's certificate both said that an autopsy had been performed according to law, and it hadn't been. So, you know, this autopsy can still be done. They do autopsies on people that died 200 years ago. I mean, whatever remains you've got is what you got. There's physical evidence here. It needs to be examined. They're very sophisticated. The uh, forensic uh, anthropologists and stuff like that, they can do incredible stuff these days. Sandra asks, what is the larger cultural context behind beyond him Possibly changing the Americans' mindset on Vietnam that may have contributed to the assassination. Kind of addressed that, didn't we? I think we did. Yeah, it's it's, it's maybe maybe she asked her question before we, we covered it, but it, it is it it did. He he was such an influential man, uh, and it, it wasn't just the Vietnam War. He was opposed to nuclear weapons. We still have those. Kennedy was opposed to nuclear weapons. John F. Kennedy. He didn't want Israel to get the bomb. I mean. These men uh, were really, uh, you know, fighting for the survival of the human race. I mean, they, Merton was a, was uh, wanted to get rid of all nuclear weapons, and and we still should get rid of nuclear weapons. We just don't have a voice like his anymore. We don't have anybody that's speaking uh, for peace like these men did. And, and, and I mean, there are people, but they're just not the leaders. Our leaders are not speaking for peace. And Merton was a leader, an important figure. These days, they won't let you into power. And once you say anti-war, your just your political career is kaput. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a point beyond his wealth being anti-Vietnam War? Do you think there's anything? I mean, what kind of money do you think the money flows were per year to the Abbey from his output? I don't know. You know, I'll tell you, there was a guy that was it was the guy that got convicted of embezzling at the Abbey a few years ago, and I think he stole several million dollars. He was a bookkeeper. But, you know, if you, if you steal several million dollars and uh, you're the embezzler, you're probably not stealing all the money. You're just taking a little bit of it, you know, <laughs> trying not to be noticed. Uh, I have no idea how much income comes in there. But, you know, he, he he's responsible for about 70 books and everything he's written, they own. So, like, if I wanted to, we, we quoted Merton in our first book. We had to pay for that. Uh, the pictures of Merton that I have, like on the cover of our books, I, I have to pay for that. Uh, that's what I like about someone like Thomas Aquinas or St. Augustine. You can quote them all you want because there's no copyright. But the Abbey uh, owns everything Merton, uh, almost like Disney owns Mickey Mouse. I mean, they just you're not going to be able to, to publish a quote by Thomas Merton in a book unless you pay for it. So, I mean, the money flows of some of these guys like him are probably more than they were alive. And that book sold millions of copies. So if they're just making a buck a copy, books are still 
and that's just one book. Yeah, you go into a Catholic bookstore and look up Martin and titles, and they're, they're just they're all over the place. And he, because he's he's the man who's who's relevant. It's the things he said are still relevant today. Let me tell you one of the things. This is a quote of his, and I, I got a couple that I really like. But he said, "Peace demands the most heroic labor and the most difficult sacrifice. It demands greater heroism than war. It demands greater fidelity to the truth." and a much more perfect purity of conscience. We don't have anybody that talks like that today. It's just, he's, he was an amazing. Yeah, yeah and he, I think that's a great way to end it. Where can people buy the book and where can people find you, Hugh? Well, I, our, our website is, uh, is uh, themartyrdomofthomasmerton.com. It's all one word, themartyrdomofthomasmerton.com. And uh, you can, there are links to the books here. The books are at Amazon. Uh, Thomas Merton's Betrayers, The Case Against Abbott, James Fox, and author John Howard Griffin. And then the other one, the first one was The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton. And uh, because uh, we're kind of up against the news media, uh, I encourage everybody to, to share the information they get, not just on this program, but all of the programs that, that you air uh, need to be shared. We need to share them with each other because that's how we, we can communicate the truth to one another today. Amen. Yeah, share this one if anybody's listening. And uh, thanks so much again. It's Hugh Turley. Last name is spelled T-U-R-L-E-Y. I will put the website, The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, on my show notes. And it looks like you can contact him through that. And again, the book we talked about, just published, full title is Thomas Merton's Betrayers, the case against Abbott James Fox and author John Howard Griffin by Hugh Turley and David Martin. Thanks so much for your time.